Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. Avoid anybody who promises instant, permanent, swing-like-a-pro results. It's just not going to happen. It may happen on some shots in the golf school, and that does happen for most of our students in our golf school. We also tell people, look, this is a process that you're starting. If you think you're going to come to the school, and we're going to teach you in three days how to swing like a pro, and that's going to be your swing that you'll take to the golf course for even most of your rounds of golf, you're kidding yourself. I mean, it can't be done. If anybody's promising that level, of, I'm talking permanent improvement in three days, obviously avoid those people like the play because they're, they're liars. What you want to expect is to get information that you can use for the rest of your life to get better at golf. And you want to learn how to learn it. And you have to learn from the golf school how to practice effectively, both home practice, which is the most effective way to practice, and what you do at the range. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to Golf Smarter for members only, Jim. Thanks, Fred. Great to be back. (laughs) We never left. (laughs) <laughs> and that's it. I really appreciate you. I mean, when we started, I said, you got about 30 minutes? And you went, yeah, fine. And now we're going to go for another 30. Yeah, so uh, it's, as long as your wife lets you have the phone, this is okay. Um, right. <laughs> so you were, we were talking about, you know, just in between the time we were recording about the, the technicality here. And you were kind of apologizing for being so technical. But, I, I you know... I don't think that's an issue. I think people love to hear this kind of, of, of technical talk um, and detailed talk. But you say this is just not a common conversation. This is more like an argument that takes place in the teaching world? Uh, yeah, it's a, big, it's a big raging argument. It has been for, I don't know, maybe the last three years especially because there's so many older pros, guys my age or even older, I'm 60 now, who... You know, not for, not for bad reasons, but for legitimate reasons were basically, you know, the information at the time when, when, when they were younger pros was, not, again, not 100%, but in general, if you look at the old PGA teaching manual especially, it doesn't say what people often accuse it of saying. But it, over time, because some well-known teachers, I won't even say who they are, but there's been some well-known teachers for years taught that the ball will start on the direction the path is pointing that the club head is moving relative to the target line through impact at the moment of impact. Uh, so, the, so if it's so if the club head is moving just before and just after impact down the target line, it never moves in a straight line. Literally, I mean, it's moving in an arc. So if it's the tangent of the arc, uh, which when the ball happens to be sitting there, uh, where the club head approaches the target line, almost in a straight line, not literally, it's still moving in an arc, right? But if, it's, if the club head itself is moving perpendicular to the target line as it, as it hits the ball, the ball will go straight. Now, obviously, that, that there should have been a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, uh, a, a, a red warning flag. <laughs> this is not, you know, the, the red warning flag, is, and, it's, and it's also something that was understood by myself at the time when I was first coming up in the game, and a lot of teachers I know. That's assuming, of course, that the club face angle is not changing. Mm. The problem is that golf club head is one unit, right? There's a there's thing we call the golf club head, which is obviously attached to the shaft. Or I should say the shaft is attached to the club head. But it's possible to swing the club head path in one direction and have the club face angle pointing in a completely different direction. They don't. There's no guarantee the club face angle is going to be square in the arc of the club head path, no, right? Of course not. Yeah. yeah, because you can you can simply in other words, you can you cannot change the shaft plane angle, which is another way of saying club head path, but you can change the face angle independent of what what the shaft plane or club head path is simply by rotating the muscles in your wrists. If you rotate the muscles in your wrists in a counterclockwise direction, the club face angle is going to close or point to the left. For, if you yeah. rotate your wrists to the le- to the right in a clockwise direction, the club face is going to be open or point out to the right. Right. Yeah. And so, but on the other hand, if you if you have a proper grip and proper grip pressure, and that's two things. The third thing, you learn how to cock your wrists 
or I should more accurately cock and hinge your wrist correctly so that the club face stays square to the arc of the path as you do the wrist cock and wrist hinge. And you swing on plane, which is another way of saying having zero degrees of a club club head path at impact, you're gonna get a, you're gonna hit a pretty straight shot, right? It's not gonna go not gonna go way off to the right or left, not gonna curve very much or even at all. Uh, and in, in 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 the real world, most people who have path problems, or let me put this way, in the real world of golf, most golfers who have directional starting line direction problems, not curvature problems, people who push the ball off the tee, for example, or people who pull the ball off the tee, they don't have that problem because of face angle, typically. I mean, there are people who do, for sure, but there, it's probably less than 10% of amateur golfers. Hmm. 90% of amateur golfers, if they pull the ball, they pull the ball because they come over the top and they reroute the club head path from, from on plane to severely out to in, i.e. pointing to the left to impact. And their club face angle is basically square to that path or maybe very slightly open, more, more commonly, very slightly. So the ball will start out to the, to the left of the target line, sometimes way left, and then curve, curve moderately, typically, to the right. But aren't, aren't the, um, the, the wrists and the arms working independently uh, of each other? So like your path and your, your point of contact uh, will be different because they don't, it's not all one unit there. Well, that's part of the challenge of learning good golf swing mechanics. You've got to you've got to train the, the, the three main subsystems, which are your pivot, your, how your body rotates, your, how your upper arms work, and how your right elbow bends and straightens, and your forearms rotate, if any, and and your wrist cock and hinge. Those are the three subsystems. In a good golf swing, they work as a team in synchrony with each other, and the result is a club face angle these days for most of the swing until just, just before impact, stay square to the arc of the path. That's what you want. You know, if you want a backswing where the club face angle changes not at all, it stays square to the path, and you want a path that's on plane, right? Not severely into out, not, not severely out to in, which looks simple and clean. When you look down the line view, if you look at the, almost all the young players today, they swing it pretty much exactly on plane. Whereas if you look at someone like Jim Pure, he looks like he's got like 16 different loops and dips and curls in his, in his motion, right? Right, right. You can see the loops that go to take place. So his, he's changing his path dramatically, right? But if you don't change your path dramatically, swing the club shaft on the proper plane angle, which is, again, changing the proper path, just a different way of describing it. And you don't rotate the face open or shut at all on the backswing. You keep it square to the arc. Uh, then it's just simply a matter of how you let the club head release when you let your wrist cock angle open up on the downswing. Do you add forearm rotation, or do you keep the club face square to the arc, you know, through impact, or do you let the let the club face go the other way and open up a little bit at some point? It depends if you want to hit the ball straight, if you want to draw the ball, if you want to hit a little fake, right? Right. So there's options there. But what you don't want is a big change, if any. If you are going to change the face angle a tiny bit during release, you don't want a big change to, 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 in terms of shutting it because then you'll hit a big hook. Because right? there'll be too big a difference between the path and the face angle. It'll start to the left, and it'll, it'll curve more to the left. And you don't want a big change in the face angle to the right, because it'll start to the right of your target line, and it'll curve more to the right. So the reason why people have this argument that's just so, it's just, you know, in the Gosling forums, it's still raging. For some reason, it, it hits people's emotional buttons. Right? Mm. People forget, and I posted this before. I, here's what I say in, in a nutshell I say, here's the deal. It's better to think about the old ball flight laws for the for the transition into the downswing, and even even the very first part of release, the old ball flight laws have more influence on what the ball does than the new ball flight laws. Even though the new ball flight laws are correct from a physics standpoint, and the old ball flight laws are incorrect. In other words, it's much more important for the average golfer, especially, to understand what's happening well before impact than it is at the moment of impact, because there's nothing you can do to influence impact. Right. But I have a question about impact I, and um, about my left hand. And this is a question about me, not about golfers. When, when I'm making contact at, at that point of impact uh, and contact with the ball, should my, the back of my left hand, where should it be pointing? It depends on how you grip the club. I hate, hate to sound like an equivocator, <laughs> but it's true. Although I am an equivocator, just kidding. But uh, 
it depends how you grip it. If you grip it really strong with, with your hand, your left hand well over to the right of the club face when you grip it, right? So you maybe like you get all your knuckles showing, like a like a Paul Azinger or a Fred Couple or a Bernard Longer type of grip, right? Mm-hmm. When you say all um, my knuckles are showing, wait, 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 what? Just you mean that I can that I'm, when I'm looking down, I can see all the knuckles on the yeah. On, when you're on the in the left dress hand? and you have yeah, okay. on the left hand, you should if you can see more than a, three knuckles or more, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then you probably don't want to have the you know, less than that showing. So if you, so let's say you had three knuckles at, at a dress. I don't, I you have only two. Have one knuckle. Okay. Let's say, you, let's say you have two mm-hmm. and you only, you can only see one knuckle or even half a knuckle at impact. Mm-hmm. You're going to hit a pull hook. If that's mm-hmm. your, it's going to start to the left and it's going to, well, again, assuming your path is either on plane or out to the right a little bit, you're going to hit a pull hook. If that's where your left hand is at impact. Mm. Right. Yeah. Because you, because you rolled your forearm counter counterclockwise too much. Which is why, if you grip it too strong in your left hand, you cannot let that natural momentum type of, for, of left forearm counterclockwise rotation aspect of release happen without hitting even a severe snap hook, where it starts way left, barely gets airborne, you know, just dives into the into the ground. Yeah. So this is in the opposite. If 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 you look down at a dress and you only have a half a knuckle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you better you better pretty much have a half a knuckle at impact. If, if if now you've got knuckles showing, if you in other words, if you really call reverse roll your forearms and you roll clockwise during release or at any time during the swing, it doesn't really matter. Then the face is going to be open relative to probably where your path is going to be, mm-hmm. and it'll start to the right and it'll fade to the right, or slice to the right. So well, one of the that's things why that a good grip is so important. You don't want to you don't want to have if you're like most people, you don't want to have a, a, a severely weak or severely strong grip. Mm-hmm. You know, which basically means for most people, if you, I, mean, I don't like to use the knuckles thing. It's just, it's it's easy to do it over a radio, you know, a podcast interview, but there's actually a better way to do it using a mirror. But, but, you know, it'll do for now. So basically, if you're around two, two and a half knuckles, that's pro- and you have your the club shaft pretty much right where your zipper is, maybe a little bit to the left of your zipper, then that's probably in the ballpark of being a good grip. When I uh, address the ball, I can see two knuckles, okay? Um, and, but when I make contact, I can see three, maybe four, okay? Um, and that's not let, good. That that's means not the face good. is open. Yeah. yeah. That means you're going to hit a lot right. of slices. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to hit the ball. It's going to f- fade or it's going to slice. Gonna, it, again, assuming if you, hit an, if you swing on plane or have a good club head path, that ball is going to start to the right of your target line, mm-hmm. and it's going to slice off to the right even further. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, in reality, most pros have good grips. They don't have extremely strong or extremely weak grips. There are exceptions. I'm talking most pros have around the two knuckles, right? And the and the right hand is pretty similar. It's not way underneath the shaft or way over to the pointing to the left. It's pretty much you know, close to mimicking the, uh, the the left hand. And you're saying and in front of the zipper? Pro- to the, just uh, well, the- I'm talking about I'm talking relative to the club face. I mean, they don't have right. they don't have their they don't have the right hand too far to the right or too far to the left. It's sort of you know, it's a little bit. Most pros have both palms a little bit, anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees, to the right of the club face angle when they hold on to the club. Mm-hmm. Which means the V's, which I think are better than the knuckles, the V's. Right. The are V's between the between, thumb and the, the, the V being the. Yeah, the, the, yeah the, that V will point somewhere the between the right ear and the tip of the right shoulder. Most of them are right, almost exactly in the middle between those two extremes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Between the right ear and the right shoulder, right in the middle there. Now, I would never uh, have noticed that position on my hand at impact if it wasn't for the work I've been uh, doing on the range with the Tour Striker. Uh-huh. Uh, it's it's amazing to me how much I learned about my swing with just one bucket yeah. with that Tour Striker. Because you're trying to add, you're doing that mistake because you don't trust the idea that if you hit down it'll go up. You're trying to add loft by opening the face. Right. I mean, you're subconsciously doing. I know you're not doing it consciously, but your subconscious mind thinks. If I hit down with this tour, with any club, not just a tour striker, I'm going to drive the ball deeper into the ground. It's not, it's not even going to get airborne. And so what happens is this, is, this is the beauty of the, what I call the mind-body connection. Your subconscious sends an impulse to the muscles in your left forearm, and you reverse roll, you roll clockwise, which adds loft to the face and also makes the point off to the right, both at the same time. And you're probably going to be flipping your wrist sideways, too. Your right wrist is going to probably flip you know, toward the target to, 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 to the left, right? 
And that will also add loft, although it'll shut the face. It has the opposite effect. As far as the, but the point is you're, you're going to try to do one or, one or both of those things at the same time to add loft, mm-hmm. to try to scoop it. And that's, you know, that's what, I spend a lot of my time. I make a lot of my living. I probably make 20% of my annual income teaching people not to do that. Mm. Seriously. Which is why I like why I like Martin's invention. I like the tour strike. I think it's a great a great training aid. Yeah, he has come work. up with something really really because I you know I get thrown to these training aids all the time, um, yeah. and I'm like, eh. but this one it, like as soon as I as soon as I hit a ball with it, I was like, oh, it made yeah, so it's much a big sense light bulb, to me. Isn't it? <laughs> it really is. It made so much sense to me. Um, and and he's a great guy, and I'm just so happy for him that you know that he's come up with something that works and that people love, and you know, I mean, and, and it just makes so much sense. That's why you know, from a teaching standpoint, I I always say I keep reiterating. I mean, every podcast I tell, I've, I've said this to your listeners. You know, it doesn't matter what you think intellectually. Your body only listens to your subconscious when you're moving at normal speeds in any sport. Now, if you're moving in super slow motion, yeah. Right. Then your intellectual mind can control your body, but you can't play golf in slow motion. No. You know, William James said it. I think I've used this quote before with you. You know, the founder of American psychology said back in I think it was in 1905. He said, "In a conflict between the will, in parentheses, conscious mind, and the imagination, in, in my parentheses again, subconscious mind, the imagination always wins. Always." In other words, if you want to lose weight only at the level of intellectual understanding and your subconscious wants to keep eating, you know, a lot of sugar, a lot of, a lot of carbs, you're going to fail at your weight loss program. Right. You, you have to want the change at a deeper level of your, of your mind for the, change to be, for the change to become a reality. And it's the same way in teaching golf. I mean, I had a guy who was, who was scooping so bad trying to add loft. I mean, we tried everything. This was before, before the tour striker, which I got last summer. I tried for two hours everything I know, and the guy wasn't really getting better, right? I finally took him to, we're lucky because the front of our range, when we get this past the, where the range is cut, you know, short for people to hit off of, it, it goes down at about a 45-degree angle on a hill for about maybe 30 feet. Hmm. And the only way I got this guy to hit down was to have him hit off a 45-degree angle downward slope. And I said, let your back leg go forward so it crosses over your front leg just after impact. Kind of like that Gary Player walk-through drill, you know, you people talk what? about. What? And finally, after an hour of doing that, he was hitting down. And, of course, as soon as he hit down, the ball went up in the air really high. And he finally got it. But until then, it was like a wrestling match between me and his subconscious. Hmm. That's yeah. what it is. That's what I do all day. And I wrestle with people's subconscious. Yeah, and you're not going to win. I do win eventually because I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I need more time, which is gets back to the golf school. By the way, that's the advantage of a golf school in an all-day format versus a one-hour lesson. You have more time to finish and win the wrestling match with the student subconscious. I see. Because that's literally what – that's the big advantage of doing an all-day boot camp, eight-hour-a-day total immersion golf school. We wear down the old – movement patterns because we help we help the student have more and more it's not just one light bulb in three days it's like it's like you know five or six or eight or ten light bulbs a day for three days in a row right, right? well how so does somebody leaves, know well, he, when, when searching for a golf school how do they know that they're on the right track i mean what should they be looking for what you know they because there's so many golf schools out there's so many opportunities um and you really you've never worked with these people before most likely you're going to travel to go to do this uh right. and you know the follow-up now luckily because of the web you can do follow-up that's great because you really need that, but how do you know this is going to be the right school? What well, is it that we should be looking if for? I was a, yeah, if I was a golf school consumer, here's what I would think. First of all, you've got, you've got, you've got to realize what the expectations of the average. Probably the average golfer, to put it mildly, has unrealistic expectations for how to go about improving their game. They, it's like that guy I mentioned. He, didn't, he thought he was at graduate school level of, of, of learning and training, and he was still in preschool. He just didn't know it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you do is, first of all, avoid anybody who promises instant, permanent swing like a pro results. It's just not going to happen. Now, 
it, it may happen on some shots in the golf school, and, and, our, and that does happen for most of our students in our golf schools. We get people hitting some of their shots like a pro. But we also tell people before they sign up, look, this is a process that you're starting. This is a journey. If you think you're going to come to the school and we're going to teach you in three days how to swing like a pro after you leave, and that's going to be your swing that you'll take to the golf course for even most of your rounds of golf, you're kidding yourself. And then I usually say it's a joke. By the way, we do have that school. That that one costs a million dollars. <laughs> All right. You know, you get what you pay for. Yeah, right, right. right. I mean, it can't be done. If anybody's promising that level, of, I'm talking permanent improvement in three days, they they're, they're obviously avoid those people like to play because they're, they're, they're liars, right? right? They're con artists. Mm-hmm. What you want to expect is to get information that you can use for the rest of your life to get better at golf, right? Even if it's just... And again, the early stages of learning, even, even though it will be only theoretical, you want r- rock-solid information, and you want to learn how to learn it. The, the, I mean, my operating assumption is my students don't know how to learn it, because I know from 20 years of doing this that 95 out of 100 people have no idea how to learn golf skills. Hmm. They don't know there are rules for learning effectively. And so we cover that in the first day, the, the morning of the first day especially. And you have to learn from the, from the golf school how to practice effectively, both home practice, which is the most effective way to practice, not range practice, but there also is a need for some range practice. So there's two types of practice, what you do at home, which is probably 80% of that slow motion mirror work, and what you do at the range. And there are rules for effective practice. So if they're going to teach you how to learn, what to learn, the content, the mechanics, the information, and how to practice it so that four, you, number four on the list, you end up at some point in the, in the future, and not 10 years out, but more like you know three months out, six months out, nine months out, you start to strike the ball significantly better most of the time, 80% of the time or more often. That should be your goal. Um, not, not to expect to walk away but with, after three days with a new golf swing. But you know, people tell us that all the time. People go, oh, I almost didn't come because I knew my buddies would tease me if I took this golf school, spent all this money for three days. And if I come back, I'm not like, you know, a thousand percent better at ball striking. They're going to tease me and say, you wasted your money. I go, can you name any other skill-based activity in the world that if you went away for three days, you'd be expected to, to perform like a professional or even close to a professional? Yeah. If you went to a violin camp or a piano camp for three days, and none of your none of your music friends would would say to you, "Oh, you're still playing Rachmaninoff really badly. <laughs> <laughs> why are, why aren't you playing like a pro? Why, 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 why aren't you playing the violin like Isaac Perlman? What's the matter? What happened? Did that it, golf school rip it, you off? Only right, golfers think like that. Yeah, it's incremental, it, and you've <laughs> got to accept that it's going to be incremental, not exponential. Yeah, right? Exactly. It's a process. Yeah. So that's that's what people should expect. You know, and the irony is the people who come to us, even though they hear this, it's on our website. We tell people, you know. Because, you know, the more successful you are as a teacher, the more, the more those kind of students flock to you because they hear about you in the media or from, or from word of mouth that you're a great teacher, and they assume that you have some kind of magic touch that you're going you know, to touch their shoulder and they're going to become an instant better ball striker. So it's even harder for people like myself with kind of national reputations, right, because we get that type of person. <laughs> so uh, the irony is the people who come to us with exactly the opposite attitude don't have zero expectations in fact, people say to me, I don't expect to improve at all in the next three days. I'm probably going to be worse when I leave. And, of course, that never happens. People always leave better than when they started, right? Most people are significantly better. Again, not permanent yet because they haven't had time to make it a habit. But they have, they're, they're definitely hitting the ball better than when they first arrived. But the guy who has that attitude, who has zero expectation, is the guy who improves the most in the three days. And the guy who thinks he's going to learn it all in three days is the one who struggles the most. Isn't that yeah. weird? Yeah. Yeah. So that that should be a lesson to all your listeners. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you the, the mentioned... more you expect, the more you self sabotage. Right. 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 Yeah. Expectations, um, you're going to lose. Yeah. Absolutely. You get in your because you you literally get in your own way. It, it retards learning. And if you have no expectations, you can't be disappointed. If you have no expectations, you can't be disappointed. Yeah, well, when you have no expectations, one thing happens is you've got these, we call the three centers. You've got a mental center, a movement or body center, and an emotional center. And they're all three, this is why we have a triangle as our logo for our company. All three influence, each of those three centers influence the other two. 
right? So you could have uh, a PGA Tour Pro level mental center, meaning the ability to focus your mind, like we talked about in the last podcast, you know, a couple months ago. You could have a PGA Tour Pro body in terms of fitness, core flex, core strength, flexibility, body awareness, feel sense awareness, right? And you could have a severely neurotic Woody Allen, you know, nebbish kind of, you know what I'm talking about? Kind of, uh, yes. yeah, a nebbish, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, you know <laughs> I know all the Jewish words. I'm, I'm Irish Catholic. I know I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. But the point is, you could have a very neurotic, fear-based, anxiety-based, uh, emotional center, and it'll retard learning, and it'll it'll inhibit you and the other two. It'll it'll contaminate the other two, the mind and the body. So that's a part of golf that's almost never discussed. But I mean, the emotions have a huge impact on how you learn, how you practice, and obviously how you play. So we we say we want a quiet emotional center. We want a calm, almost neutral, for learning especially. The more you can keep your emotions sort of in neutral gear, the the better you're going to learn. But the more you have uh, ego or emotion attached to having a successful learning outcome, the harder it is to be to learn. Mm -hmm. So that means you have to, you know, if you want to be a good golf school student, you want to ideally, before you leave your house, to come to see us or any other golf school, you should basically be willing to fail, embrace failure. Be, say to yourself something along the lines of, well, I'm going to probably hit a lot of bad shots in the next three days. That's okay. I'll learn from my mistakes, right? Right. But if you're the kind of person who says, as soon as I hit two or, two or three bad shots in a row, you know, I'm going to quit. I'm not, I'm not going to follow the program. Then that, that person's not going to learn anything. No. No, and, and I've seen students try, try a new uh, a new way of understanding the golf swing. Say, say again, back, back to risk. Let's say we're working on risk cock. And I've had a person literally walk away when I'm halfway into a five-minute lecture demonstration, leave the group, which is all just you know, people standing around in a group in a circle, walk over to his, team, his little spot on the tee, grab a ball, take a full-speed swing in his mind, thinking about what I just said, but not doing it, thinking about it, right? Pop the ball and look at me and say, "Well, that doesn't work." <laughs> <laughs> and then be a you suck, it. Jim. <laughs> and I'm like, "Wait a minute! You didn't do what I asked you to do in your wrist. <laughs> you did your old wrist mechanics, and that's why you topped the ball." There's a difference between thinking about doing it and actually physically doing it. Sure. Right? But, but again, the, the person whose ego, in a very neurotic way, is so wrapped up in achieving success and avoiding failure at all costs. That guy is learning dysfunctional for golf. Mm. So you you know you got to approach it with a with a healthy emotional attitude to, to be successful. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that you said uh, about your students, people who come to your school, is they'll they like just the first thing they'll tell you is I need more distance, right? I want more distance, yeah, that's and very that's common, yeah, very common. Yeah. I would think. How mm-hmm. often do you get people say I need more accuracy? Uh, not, not, in fact, I'll give you the order of the three things. Consistency, <sighs> accuracy, distance are the three primary goals for ball striking. Yeah. Number one okay. of those three by far is consistency. Okay. And, and well, how do they define, how do they define consistency? I mean, it's like I had a guy say to me on the golf course, he says, you know what I want for Christmas this year? Two good shots in a row. <laughs> I don't know, it's great. Yeah, that's, that's that's like that's like a gambler going to Vegas and saying I want I want to win you know win uh, at the roulette table two times in a row or a blackjack two times in a row. No, cons- we actually define it for people because most people don't really know they have sort of a vague conceptual understanding of what consistency means. Mm-hmm. We tell people, look, I go if you could hit somewhere in the vicinity of your target, not exactly the target, but but you know either at the target exactly or you know you know close to it, you know. Uh, you know, if you want to be more precise, we could say the driver, for example, the hardest club in the bag to hit for most people. Uh, let's say the guy's hitting five fairways around, right? Mm-hmm. Out of 14 fairways in a typical go- round of golf, you'll be able to drive her 14 times off the tee. And I would say for someone like that, if they could get it up to, you know, 10 or 11 fairways around, that'd be a pretty one specific way to define consistency. But in general, we say if you can hit your target or close to your target eight out of 10 times, on the range first, because it starts there first before it transfers to the golf course. That would be a reasonable goal. And we define that as skill. And if you're just the opposite, if you're hitting if you're hitting at or close to your target one out of ten times, that's luck. 
Because wow. a beginner can do that. Yeah. A total beginner can do that, right? And most of our students are probably in their three to five range. Okay. And so they want to move it from, say, a four or a five to like a, a seven or an eight. Mm-hmm. And when they get there, they're really happy, and, and, they start, and their scores start coming down. Because the number one stat for lower scores for all skill ranges, from pros to beginners, is greens and regulation. And that means your, your first shot, your tee shot, has to be decent. Because if, if you hit it in the rough and you're an average golfer, unless you bomb it a mile off the tee, you're probably not going to hit the green in your second shot. So that means ball striking, which is you know, it's something I've always talked about for years. It's, it's a, I call it the short game myth. The myth is that short game and putting is the, way, is the only way or the main way to significantly lower your scores, and it's just not true. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't count the kick-in putts, the, the gimme putts, mm-hmm. right, uh, take those away, and, and putting and the short game combined are not as many shots as most people think they are, right? Really? And the other reason why I say that is if, if, you can, if, your, if your ball striking skills are good, it automatically tra- – I mean, 80% of the fundamentals in the short game are, are the same fundamentals as, as they are in the long game which most of my students, when they first come to see us, don't know. They think, they think there's a whole separate set of fundamentals uh, that are completely different between short game and long game. In reality, there's a set of universal fundamentals that are common to both, and there's a set of separate, unique fundamentals common to the short game. Right? Both things are true. But you're wasting your time trying to learn the unique aspects, the unique short game fundamentals, if you haven't mastered the universal fundamentals common to both first, uh, okay. like spine angle. Like balance, like like finish, like wrist cock or r- wrist cock release, like weight transfer, like pivot. If you haven't mastered the grip, setup, aim, and alignment, if you haven't mastered those things that are common to both short game shots and by, by short game is not putting, putting is a separate game. But if you haven't mastered those fundamentals that are universal, then you then, then you're going to basically suck at short game and long game. <laughs> right. And and I have to believe that the people come in when when uh, they say I want to be more consistent. And you say, well, hit a couple balls for me, and you're standing there watching them, and you just see that you have to make some major changes in, in their address, their approach, their grip, you know, the basics there, that they're like, no, 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 I'm fine with that. I just want to be more consistent. You must, that that must... gets back to part one. That's the guy I mentioned in part one. He thought he had already known all that. He didn't need to know that again. Now, Do most people feel that way, though? Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> again, not wanting to be an equivocator, to be honest. But, well, he was an extreme example, which is why I'm using him. Right. Because his again, the, the gap between where he thought he was and where he actually was in terms of his physical skill was way bigger than the average person I work with. But the average person I work with has the same quote unquote disease or neurosis, but at a much much more milder level. Mm-hmm. But yeah, most people have never learned the basics. I hear it all the time. I even get people who are single digits, like seven eight handicaps, come to see me and they say, "Oh, for some reason, all of a sudden, I can't I can't chip the ball anymore." And then I watch him chip, and I don't say anything for like, I just watch him chip for like five minutes. And, and at five minutes, they'll maybe hit, you know, you know, I don't know, 15 chips or so, say, right? Mm-hmm. And of the 15, none have what I would consider proper mechanics, not one out of the 15. Wow. But of the 15, he'll put three or four within a foot or two of the hole, right? And then he'll put, you know, three or four just terrible, not even, maybe not even hit it on the green or being way over the green or way short. Right, and the rest will be you know eight feet from the hole, right? And he'll go, see, I can put three or four pretty close. And then I say something like, to be honest, because this is how this is my teaching style. I go, well, the problem is, is that even the ones that are, even the three that are like you know within you know short putt range, say a foot, foot or three or three feet away, those are also mishit. Wow. He'll go, well, what do you mean they're mishit? I go, they were mishit. You didn't hit it solid. You chunked it a little bit, or you or you hit it a little thin, but because your path and your face angle was good, you, you know they went pretty straight, uh, and you got lucky on the distance control. And it's the same. It was the same flaw that caused the other all the other shots to be much worse is present, but it was compensated for through basically through luck. In other words, your your subconscious is trying to guess how to do it right if you don't really know how to do it right, like a pro, mm-hmm. and sometimes it compensates just the right amount to the right degree for your bad technique, and you can chip it in the hole. Even. You can hole it out, right? It's still, it's still miss hit. There's a, it has to sound a certain way at impact. It has to look a certain way to a, someone like me who has a good eye for this, or on video if you want to tape it. 
uh, it, it has to have a certain contact with the ground after impact. You know, not, not too much of a divot, not too much of a downward blow, not too little of a downward blow, but just, just the right amount of downward blow for that particular shot they're trying to get with that particular club. So they, these are all what I would call laws of, of shot making. There's certain things that must occur for it to be struck properly, right? And most people don't know what those laws are. They just know that every once in a while they, they get it close, and most of the time they don't. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a driving range, and you, you talk about consistency hit, is hitting their target, you know, like eight to ten times if, if they're all lucky. But people are like, it's not even a target. I mean, if they hit the ball straight one time, you know, they'll go, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm done. I, good. That's what I was looking for. I got it, right? And it's not even hitting a target. It's just hitting it straight. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And but right. a, so, but so accuracy doesn't fall that high on on this guy. To me, uh, I would yeah. think that accuracy would be huge versus well, for distance. people who are people who are really really high handicappers who slice a lot. That's obviously number one. Mm-hmm. Um, although we don't get as many of those people as we used to because the technology today is it's hard to slice it bad or hook it bad. Oh, typically, slice it bad. Yeah, because the game if they're fit properly for their earlier. clubs. Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid growing up with, I actually played with hickory shafted clubs from from nineteen oh three. I think they were my grandfather's clubs. You, you didn't know, start playing heads. in nineteen oh three. I didn't. I'm not that old. But okay. I, I played with my grandfather's clubs with hickory shafts, wooden shafts. They were wow. super flexible, and the heads were really heavy. They had they had like lead shot in, you know, embedded in, in the bottom of the sole <laughs> of the club. So they were, which was great for, for talking about a training aid. It's like having a training aid. What you want as a golfer when you're learning is. Is, is relatively flexible shaft, so you can feel the head. So you can feel the shaft bend. You feel the so-called lag pressure. Help time your release, right? And you want a heavy head to get feedback to, so you, your hands wake up. So those are heavy clubs overall. that are very heavy, but flexible shafted with heavy heads are like the ideal way to learn golf, in my opinion. Uh, you can, now, you can hit them real crooked, for sure. <laughs> They're going to go... With the, with, plus the ball back there, the old wound a lot of ball, uh, you could easily hit 150 yard slices or hooks in the air. 150 yards curvature, easy. Wow. And today, maybe you'll slice it 50 yards if you're really. I mean, I can't imagine how you could possibly slice it more than that. So hmm. that hasn't been as big an issue, especially in the last 10 years with these new high tech drivers. But uh, no, it's just consistency. What drives people crazy, Fred, is being inconsistent, particularly in their long game. Where they can hit a decent shot by their, let's say they're a 15 handicap. They hit it, they hit it like a 15 handicapper would for their average shot, and then they follow follow it with a shot like a 30 handicapper. And so there's like an identity crisis. The person goes, "Wait a minute, am I a 30 or a 15 here? Who, who who's who's in control of my body? Right? Yeah. Then if they hit the third shot like a 30, right? Now they're going to have a nervous. They're about to have a nervous breakdown, right? In the most of course. So. This is what this is the nature of golf. It drives right. you know the same thing applies to a zero handicap. A zero handicap might hit like a plus five, like a tour pro in one shot, and like a fifteen in the next. It drives him crazy too. So, well, it's it's playing yeah. Ray, Ray Ray golf. Ray Ray? Yeah. You don't know Ray? Ray that you don't know Ray Ray golf? I don't know. Oh, you hit one what shot like Ray Floyd, and the next one like Ray Charles. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've never heard that. That's a good one. I'm, write, I'm writing this one down. <laughs> oh, really Jim, good. it's been great to talk to you again. Thank you so much. And listen, safe travels. Best of luck in Asia and Singapore starting your school. But uh, I want to send people to balancepointgolf.com um, and, and check it out. Obviously, Jim is a very articulate and educated instructor. And uh, you should look into um, speaking with him yourself. And at the very least, go back into other uh, uh, the older Golf Smarter episodes that Jim's been on, and you're going to learn a tremendous amount. Thanks so much, Jim, for coming back on. Fred, it was a pleasure. Let's do it again sometime soon. <laughs>